And now, ladies and gentlemen, with your wilderness, the event officially starts. And now, ladies and gentlemen, coming up is the first the keynote session. The social innovation for SDGs. And the keynote speaker is Miss Audrey Dunn, Digital Minister of Executive Yen. So, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for the first section today? Are you ready? Yes, okay. I know we are going to have the wonderful journey of the AI. So, do you believe me? Yes, let's start our journey. So, ladies and gentlemen, give us a huge applause and let's welcome Miss Audrey Dunn, Digital Minister of Executive Yang. Hello, everyone. Uh, very, very happy to be here, and uh, I believe the projection will be up in a minute. Um, so uh, while we begin for the projection to start, let me first remark that thank you all the organizers for putting this event together. Uh, and uh, we see a lot of energy, um, including the exhibition that we can literally hear the energy here. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask you to join me in crowdsourcing uh, the speech. Uh, that I'm going to give. So the basic idea, very simply put, is that uh, if you have a phone or something, you can connect to this uh, platform called Slido. That's S-L-I-D-O.com. It should be up in any minute. Um, or, yes. So uh, you can either scan the QR code, or you can just go to slido.com and enter today's date before um, a zero. You don't have to enter the hash sign. So 01115 once you're in slido.com. And, uh, or you can scan the QR code, it's the same thing. And once you're in this chat room, uh, you're part of the collective intelligence. You can ask me any questions whatsoever in the next 40 minutes or something. Uh, and you can also like each other's questions. The question with the most number of likes will float to the top, and the new questions will appear in the bottom. And in this way, uh, if you see some question that you yourself would also want to like, you don't have to type it over again. And the best thing about this chat room is that it's all anonymous, right? So nobody knows who asked the question, so we um, can ask a lot of very direct questions. Everybody is using the phone anyway. Um, and so uh, I will answer things like that. So uh, the first question being, how was my day? My day has just started. I'm very, very honored to be here and speak with you. And I'll begin with a short presentation, and then I'll go back uh, to the questions that you all have uh, here about digital social innovation. So to begin with, I would like to share with you my office. This is my office, uh, the digital minister's office uh, in the national government in Taiwan. Um, this is called the Social Innovation Lab. It's near the Jianguo Flower Market. So uh, every weekend, uh, the Jianguo Flower Market and Jade Market opens. So if you happen to be around in the weekend, this is a great place to go. Uh, and just near the Jianguo Flower Market is this place co-created by hundreds of social innovators in Taiwan. Uh, we're just celebrating our first anniversary uh, later this week. Uh, and so you can notice the geometry here is very interesting because it's drawn by people with Down syndrome. It turns out the people with Down syndrome see the world through a different geometric lens and they speak this geometric language better than we do. And so which is why we work with the social enterprises to turn their unique visions to the world and integrate, include their visions into the design of this space. And so this spirit of co-design and co-creation, I learned myself when I was 15 years old. That was 1996, and the World Web was just starting. And I told my teachers and the principal saying, you know, this World Web thing is just starting, and I can either be reading the textbooks, which are all 10 years out of date anyway, or I can join this AI research and uh, create the textbook 10 years in the future. And so I want to drop out of junior high school and start my own first startup enterprise. And surprisingly, all my teachers agree with it. They also wanted to join. And so this shows something about Taiwan's innovative uh, culture when a uh, junior high school principal and teachers can agree for a student to drop, just drop out of the second year of junior high to start a startup together. 
And then uh, I joined this internet society in the World Web Consortium, and which all run with this crazy idea of radical transparency, radical trust, and voluntary association. And these are the lessons that I learned when I ran my first startup in the internet community in the early um, 90s. And so I'm bringing these spirit uh, as Taiwan's first digital minister and is changing our society. And so when we talk about co-creation, we don't just mean that the rule of the social innovation space is co-created by innovators. Like they said, we have to have a chef, so we have a chef. It opens until 11 p.m. every night, so after enjoying dinner, uh, people can just linger together. And as long as you work on any of the sustainable development goals here, you can use the venue free of charge as co-working space, as event space. And they asked the minister, that's me, uh, to be in the lab every Wednesday. So I'm there every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. It's my office hour, so anyone working on innovation can just talk to me, provided that they agree for the whole transcript to be published to the internet for everybody to use. And so every week, this space can change. And a few months ago, we have some special friends uh, from MIT Media Lab, and these are called persuasive electric vehicles, or PEVs. And those PEVs are self-driving tricycles. They're very um, tiny. They're about this height. Uh, and they don't move very fast, so even if they run into buildings, no, no harm done. Uh, and the best thing is that it's open source and open hardware. So any student and any co-creators can just look at it and see whether it can help, for example, elders along the Jianguo flower market to pick up flowers, pick up pots of flowers, and put it to those like companion animals, and they will just follow you around, and by the end of it, you can just hop on it and it drives you home and things like that. And then so in this way, we learn with the AI, with the collective intelligence. When we see AI, we don't think about something that is abstract, that's in the cloud or something. We think something that is very much within our everyday experience. And if you don't like the way that it shows that it, it don't know how to handle the situation, it will flash red. If you don't uh, like the way that it communicates, you can just work with a local college student that uh, with some CS and uh, WE capabilities and change to, to the face of a cat, of a dog, or something like that. So in this way, we co-create a new social norms of how to integrate AI into the society. And that is the spirit of co-creation. And the reason why is that we don't want this to be another fight between, for example, the Ministry of Economy on one side and the Ministry of Labor on one side, or the Ministry of National Development on one side and Ministry of Environmental Protection on the other side. Because this was the bad old days of last century's governance model. We have people organizing uh, through a one or two ministers, uh, and a thin line that's a rope in between are the anonymous public civil service. Uh, we don't see them much, but they absorb all the tension and try to make a fair judgment. And people just lobby on the both sides of the things around councillors and MPs and things like that. But in this century, especially after the invention of the social web, this uh, mobile web, this doesn't work at all. It is a broken model. First, because you don't need a minister or a councillor to organize. Anyone with the right hashtag can organize thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. There's no need for representative organizers anymore. And the second thing is that there's just so many emergent things. It's not just machine learning, but also distributed ledgers and like everything. Um, and we can't have one council for or one agency for every emerging technology. It doesn't work like that. So we've changed into a different governance model, what we call collaborative governance. Instead of asking how to organize people and how to make fair judgments, we now ask, everybody has different positions and that's all okay, but can we find some common values? And once we find those common values that everybody can say, oh, this is a good value, then we ask, has the government done something that is blocking this value from fully realizing itself. It may be outdated laws or regulations or policies. It may be outdated ways of organization. But we ask, given the common values, can anyone do some innovation that once adopted by a lot of people, it will solve the problem for everyone and leave no one behind. And so this kind of co-creation is called social innovation. And so to take a concrete example, 
anyone in Taiwan, if you are working on a startup idea that you think will make the society better, but our existing regulation or law somehow prevents that from happening, you can just go to the single website, sandbox.org.tw, and file a public application. An application goes like this. I want to try my idea, but the regulation or law is currently written this way. It's blocking me from realizing the social potential, so I want to change it into something else. So you, you need to provide a something else, a patch, or a pull request, or a fork of the existing regulation and law, and that's all it takes. Everything after that is automatic and free of charge. Um, a team of pro bono, uh, well, paid by taxpayers' lawyers, uh, will uh, work out exactly which uh, authority is responsible. If this platform economy, the NDC, the National Development Council will work with you. If this is AI banking, like FinTech innovation, the Minister of Finance will work with you. If this is about uh, autonomous vehicles, that's, that's something that's faster than a self-driving tricycle, then the Minister of Economy will work with you. We expect this law um, these are passed respectively in January, in April, and by December, I think the UV will also be passed. And if you need 5G broadband and things like that, it will all be uh, part of the sandbox. And so the sandbox works like this. Because it's Minister of Economy, you, you don't have to shuffle yourself into one of the existing categories of technology. Like you don't have to do a boat, car, uh, and drone separately. You can have a hybrid vehicle and you just apply this hybrid vehicle saying it will solve a social problem and then we can work with you including the business model for a year. And so this is basically encouraging you to break the law for a year and show the society that this is a better idea than our current law or regulation. And including the business model, it can be tried after a year. If the society thinks it's a good idea, it can be scaled out, it can be scaled up, you can try for another year. And by the end of the second year, if it's, the society still thinks it's a good idea, then we're obliged, if it's a regulation, to adopt your version two months after two months of public commentary, adopt your version into our regulation structure. And so you become essentially a co-creator of regulation. However, if this requires a law change, then our parliaments may need more time. So for three year or four year maximum, uh, they would deliberate it. But during that while, you essentially have a monopoly because your experiment can keep running, including the business model, until the legislators settle on the best wording. After that, the competitor will enter the market. But even if it doesn't work out, even if the society doesn't think it's a good idea, still everybody learns something, right? We thank the investors for donating the time and also the share of data so that the next innovator can try from a different angle. Now the logical question is, how do we actually know what people need? What we do, how do we actually know where the people in different areas in Taiwan, what, what they care about? Which is why I personally tour around Taiwan every other Tuesday or so. Like every Wednesday I'm in Taipei, but every other Tuesday I'm in the indigenous places, rural places, remote islands, the places that really need the technologists like you to introduce uh, your startup ideas, to work with them to improve the society. So for example, this is uh, Hualien, and more rem remote places like uh, Taidong can also teleconference in. And I go there, I live for a couple of days, I work with the local innovators, but the most important thing is that all the 12 ministries are also still in the social innovation lab, enjoying the lovely geometry, uh, enjoying the excellent food, uh, and a very relaxed atmosphere, but all the 12 ministries are there and see through my eyes, through two-way live streaming, what the local people's faces are, what their stories are, and where they raise a question, Instead of like in the bad old days, uh, the Ministry of Interior will say, oh, I'll have to ask the Minister of Finance. The Finance says, oh, I'll have to check with the Minister of Health and Welfare. And five months will have passed before you get anything from them. Um, but this time, it's impossible to do things like that because everybody is literally in the same room. So there is no way for people to shuffle things around. They can just brainstorm and get back to you at most two weeks after each regional meeting. After each regional meeting, we publish everything to the public internet two weeks afterwards, so every time people can continue the conversation. And through this way, we co-created hundreds of solutions for long-standing, lasting problems. But if after two weeks, all the ministries admit that the government at the moment doesn't have a good solution to this social or environmental problem, 
then you can use this as the cost, as the rationale to file your sandbox application because the government has essentially admitted that we cannot fix this and at least until the next budget year. So this is a room for you to uh, step in and to be involved. And so for example, if this is about uh, self-driving vehicles, we have a public exhibition space. This is just right outside the high-speed rail station in Tainan. Everybody can see a simulation of a self-driving vehicle interacting with motorcycles, with a lot of different uh, traffic scenarios, so everybody can feel safe and co-create the social norms, and we make that social norm into the technology so that they're aware by design and safe by design. And so at the end of the experimentation period, we'll have to make a judgment call of whether the society feels safe about it. And how do we do that? If you have a sandbox experiment that runs for a year, it may involve thousands of stakeholders. How do we actually listen to thousands of people? Well, we use AI to listen to people. So this is AI power conversation called Polis. And this is uh, open source technology. We've been using it for three years now. And the conversation you're seeing here is the first use uh, when we moderated um, how UberX enters Taiwan. And so a conversation like this has four steps. The first one, after a year of experiment or crowdsourced open data, we make sure everybody know what the facts are. And when we say open data, we don't just mean open government data, but citizen scientists as well. And after we can agree on the same set of facts, we just have a month to check people's feelings. For the same fact, I can feel happy, you can feel doubtful, and it's all okay. And the AI power conversation is just for feelings. But after people find the common feelings and values, then we can brainstorm on the ideas. Then best ideas are the ones that address the most people's feelings. And then if the ideas work together coherently, we turn them into a judgment that is turned into the law. So for example, when we consulted for the autonomous vehicle sandbox, this is how it looks like. Everybody gets a link on your phone, and you see your avatar here, that's in the uh, blue dot, and you see one fellow sentiment from one fellow citizen, and you can click agree or disagree. And as you click agree or disagree, your position will move among the Facebook and Twitter friends uh, that you have, or if you choose not to sign in, then among famous Facebook and Twitter friend, um, people. And that's all. So then after you click agree or disagree, the next sentiment will appear. And after doing so for a while, you can also share your own sentiment, the feelings, for other people to resonate with. And this has two effects. First, because you can see people on the other side, they're not your enemies, they're not polarized, uh, like ideological enemies, they're your friends and family, you just didn't talk about this over dinner, but now you know their position. But the second thing is that people's position can change because there is no reply button. All the spaces that we built, it could be Slido, it could be the e-participation platform, everything, it could be Polis, we don't have the reply button. And the reason why is because when we see reply button, we see people attacking each other, we see people posting cat pictures, we see people derailing um, the conversation. But if you don't have the reply button, if you don't agree with the things on it, the best thing you can do is just to propose something better for other people to vote on. So it can only add to each other, but you cannot take away from each other. And so every time after we run this conversation, we see a shape like this. And this is very counterintuitive. Because if you, you just look at mainstream media or even some social media, you will think the divisive statements are all there is because it dominates the entire discussion. But using AI-facilitated conversation, we find people spend far more energy on creating the statements that are of consensus that everybody can live with and work with. And so we bind ourselves to use those consensus statements as the agenda for the conversation, the live streamed uh, stakeholder consultation afterwards. And so through this way, we introduce the idea of social innovation by getting people's feelings together, share the common feelings, and innovate based on the feelings. And so um, finally, if we create something that is just good enough, and the society think that it can do better, we also work with a peculiar way called GovZero. I'm part of the GovZero movement. The movement started uh, around the 2012, so it's been uh, around for six years now. And the idea is very simple. I encourage you to bring this idea back to your country. We just had GovZero Italy last week. So the idea is very simple. Say you have a government service or a website. 
like the legislation is LYGOVTW or the national budget or whatever, right? The environmental agency. I'm sure it's the same in your country. Here in Taiwan, all the government services and websites start, uh, ends with GOV.TW. So very simply, Gov0 is just a domain name called G0V.TW. And so whenever anyone in the civil society see a government service or website that they don't like, they think they can do better, they can build a shadow government website with exactly the same address. You just change the O to a zero in your browser. You don't have to Google for it. You don't have to send out Facebook advertisements. All you have to do is to change a O to a zero, and then you get into the shadow government. And the shadow government is more interactive. It's more useful. And the good best thing is that in the Gov0 movement, we all relinquish most of our copyright. So by the next procurement cycle, if the government thinks it's a good idea, if the people likes the idea, it just becomes the official government website. For example, the inaugural budget budget.g0v.tw is a visualization of the national budget. You can drill down to each and every budget that you care about and have a real-time conversation around that budget item. Well, now we have merged it into the national e-participation platform, join.gov.tw. And so on join platform, you can now see all the 13 1,300 13 1, ministerial projects, their KPIs, spending, procurement, progress, everything. And in each and every budget item, you can type in any question, and a career public servant will just answer you publicly. You don't have to go through um, MPs. You don't have to go through ministers. Everybody can have a fact-based conversation around the budget item. And that was the first GovZero project that's merged now into the e-participation platform. And the platform has now 5 million active users out of 23 million people in Taiwan. So one quarter of the population is pretty good. And so we're spreading this idea, as I mentioned, to Italy. So now if you go to budget.g0v.italy, you also see the Italy GovZero because we don't have a trademark or patent on this GovZero idea, you can try it out in your own country as well. So before getting back to the questions, I want just to show you with uh, one GovZero project and then uh, a poem, and then I'll go, go to the questions. So this GovZero project is called Airbox. Uh, some of you may already have heard of it. It's one of the ideas that's really caught on in Taiwan. More than 2,000 people installed this very cheap, like less than 100 US dollars, uh, air quality measurement devices on the balcony, on their schools, on their homes, and so on. So they get a measurement that's closer to their everyday living. And then it's not just for personal use because there is a Academia Sinica project that is a network that everybody can upload to the cloud and the cloud displays so you can see at a glance the digital divide in Taiwan. Well, no. Well, uh, you can see at a glance um, the air quality in Taiwan. And so you also see that people really donate and contribute those uh, sensors, those air quality measurements without any intervention from the government. And so in other Asian countries, when I share it to other UN uh, delegates, they all tell me that in their uh, area of the world, it may not be possible. Uh, to grow to 2,000 people. If it grows to 100 people, the leader will be poached into the government. If it grows to 500 people and the leader refuses to join the government, uh, then maybe they will get disappeared because it will really challenges the legitimacy of the central authority. If you have two numbers published by the num uh, number of the environmental agency of the government on the first hand, and the one that you measured with your friends on the second hand, even though this is more precise, of course you're going to trust the one that you and your friends measured. So this really creates a legitimacy challenge to the central government. But in Taiwan, we're very unique. Uh, our central government says we can't beat them, so we just join them, and so we embrace officially all these input from the citizen scientists into our national collective intelligence platform. And we work with them saying, okay, so there is some digital divide. There are some places in the mountains and the more indigenous places that people are not contributing the citizen science measurement. So we will do that. And we also hear from our citizen scientists that they really want a measurement device here, right in the middle of the Taiwan Strait. Uh, because they want to tell the domestic versus uh, non-domestic um, airflows, uh, but they cannot really put an airbox there. Even with drones, the drone can run out of battery. Uh, and so, but we can because we're building wind-based power plants on that place. So we're placing their technology on the state-sponsored um, wind 
power plants. And so through this way, because it's all open innovation, it's just on GitHub, you don't have to ask for a license. You can just download, put on an Arduino, put on a Raspberry Pi, and you too can do this in your country. Uh, so you can also host the data analysis yourself, but if you don't change the default uh, website address, it just goes to Taiwan. And so we have a international network just, that just reports back the numbers to Taiwan. So if you're interested in this uh, cross-sectoral collaboration, you can go to collectiveintelligence.taiwan.gov.tw. And there's many people who tell us, well, how come the environmental protesters are willing to put their numbers to the National Super Hype Computing Center for AI analysis? Uh, are they not afraid that the government will change their number? And uh, we're like, no, because we work with people in the distributed ledger space. So before they upload, they take a snapshot and store it to the EOTA distributed ledger. So it's like a blockchain. And once it's on the blockchain, if we try to change the number, everybody will discover that we change the number, so we will not. So this is a very simple emerging technology that makes sure that everybody's honest, that has reliable data. And so through this way, we see digital technology not as working on just one or two of the sustainable development goals. We don't see the economy, the environment, and society as something that is in tension with each other, but actually with availability of reliable data, especially with distributed ledger, with effective partnership, especially between the collective intelligence and artificial intelligence, and with open innovation, especially AI that feels personal, like personal computer that everybody can learn and modify, we truly believe that we can create a world that is free of the old bad days where the silos, the different sectors fight against each other, but rather we can create something that is of common value to each other. And so finally, two years ago, when I entered the cabinet as a digital minister, um, people asked me to write a job description. So I'm going to read the job description to you and then go to your question for the next 20 minutes. It goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, Let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always keep in mind and always remember that the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. So uh, we have 22 questions and about 20 minutes. So I'll spend maybe one minute for each question. So what are the sustainable goals and how the AIs can help the sustainable goals? This is a great, great question. So the sustainable goals, which you can read up on globalgoals.org, um, is a set of 17 goals and 169 targets that the United Nations uh, signed into effect in 2015, that three years ago. So the uh, idea is this very simply. For three years or so, the UNDP asked the entire world, more than one million people, what is the kind of the world that you would like to see by the year 2030? And they get more than one million voices. And using, I'm sure, some automated augmented intelligence, but mostly diligent UN um, helpers, they get all those million voices into the shape that all reinforce each other rather than take anything away from each other. So you can see if you care about, for example, people here maybe care about industry, innovation, and infrastructure, and it calls for the universal access to internet, it calls for um, domestic development and industrial develop, uh, diversification, it calls for enhancing research, enhancing access, especially MISMEs, to financial services and things like that. But they make sure that each and every of those targets, they're all supporting each other. They're not taking away from each other. So these are kind of like the common values of humanity that everybody has agreed to by the year uh, 2030. We have to get there. So those are the global goals. Of course, it doesn't say how to get there. And that is where AI can help because a lot of the sustainable goals is about making innovations instead of trade-offs. 
previously, if we think in a zero-sum way, if you want to save somebody two hours of time, like in public service, somebody somewhere else in the public service will have to spend two hours or more to save you two hours of time. It's a zero-sum game. But now, with AI, we can look at any part of our work that is trivial. Trivial is a computer science term. It means that no matter who does this task, it only differs in accuracy and speed. And that's all. So this is fixed input, fixed output, and only uh, differentiation is on the precision and speed. So it calls for no communication. It calls for no life experience. It calls for no empathy. So in all our daily work, there are some moments like this that we may not be aware of it. But now if you work with experienced designers, if you work with professional consultants, or if you train yourself to be more aware of opportunities, then everybody can identify a few hours in everyday's life that are trivial. And these are the ones that we can automate with AIs, and which is why I always think of AI as augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence, because it's really just augmenting our daily life and automating away the trivial parts. And that enables the SDGs, because then we can make uh, everybody save a lot of time without uh, creating externalities er elsewhere in the world. And that is the spirit of the common goals. And I can go on and on, but it is the basic idea of it. Two people would like to know, co-creation is essential to drive innovation. That make, means making tech open source. But doesn't this mean original ideas lose competitive advantage? This is a great question. Um, this was a big debate around maybe 20 years ago uh, when the term open source was first uh, pronounced. And I was part of that movement. But now, I don't think anybody disputes this anymore. Um, Microsoft has donated all their Linux-related patents into the Open Innovation Network. Microsoft is now GitHub, right? Uh, which is one of the largest places where co-creation happens. Um, IBM is now also Red Hat. And so what we are seeing now in the, across the industry is that people are seeing the algorithms, the code, as not exactly an asset. It is more like a shared infrastructure, a shared fabric that everybody can maintain together. And so everybody don't have to spend a lot of energy on keeping it up to date. People are actually treasuring more about the relationships that they build through, for example, data exchange with the people that they care about their service or product. But the code itself is less and less of an asset and more and more of a burden, which is why more and more people are embracing open source as a way to share the maintenance burden of innovations while keeping its competitive advantage of tight relationship with the people in the stakeholder base of that particular enterprise. So this is what we are seeing in terms of open innovation, especially around software. Of course, in other places, this is still under debate. Um, in the science publishing, open access is still maybe what we were 10 years ago as open source movement, but gradually we're changing the way that people access and share and create knowledge. Three people uh, said, Love this Gov Zero idea. How do you ensure it doesn't propagate a disinformation phenomena like the one that plagued Facebook during the last US e election? Well, very carefully. Um, so as I said, if you don't have a reply button, there really is no way for other people to attack each other. And this is the most important part of it. And there are also existing Gov Zero project that works with um, this information. I'm going to just show you one very quickly, maybe a couple minutes. This is called CoFacts. Uh, for the one um, who don't read uh, Mandarin, it doesn't matter. It's just a QR code. And the uh, name of the project in Mandarin is literally Jada. Is it true or not? Okay. And so what, what's it? It's basically a bot. And it starts from um, Line, Line is a popular, it's like WhatsApp, end-to-end -end encrypted channel. Uh, it's not gender biased. Every time uh, you refresh, you see a different uh, person, uh, okay? Uh, and so once you add it as your friend on the Line, end-to-end -end encrypted channel, every time you see a rumor, you can forward to the bot. 
and the bot does a fact checking for you and get back to you whether this is true or not. And the crowdsource fact checking is entirely transparent, is in the open. And so what we see here is all the trending rumors in the dark encrypted end-to-end -end encryption channels. And I will not keep you on this screen for too long because it kind of pollutes the mind. But I only want you to know that all these get fact-checked within minutes sometimes, uh, but almost always within a few hours. And so what this does is essentially it surfaces every single rumor that is trending into a public URL so that you can both see the clarification very quickly, but it also itself become a social object that people can have a real conversation. Before, it is just a rumor on the end-to-end -end encrypted channel, but now it becomes a public URL that everybody can have a conversation. Once it becomes that, it loses its virality. It's like inoculation. It is like vaccine. Vaccine is essentially virus that are injected to people before it gets more potent. So just by getting people awareness of these rumors spreading, the civil society helps everybody to fact check what is currently trending the disinformation. So this is also an innovation that I encourage you to bring back to your country. Far as I know, people are working on WhatsApp and other versions of the same GovZero idea. Um, do I consider myself a rare breed in a Taiwan government? Am I getting enough support from the government? Yes, of course. Um, so uh, I am the digital minister, and I joined two years ago, and my staff is very unique because my staff is literally, I can poach one person from every ministry in the cabinet. There is 20, uh, 22 people in my office now. There's 34 ministries in the Taiwanese cabinet. So maximum, I can have 34 co-workers, but now I have 22. There's some ministry missing, like I don't have colleague from the Ministry of Defense for some reason, but in any case, maybe because, because I don't touch state secret, but in any case, the, this cross-silo work style is very important for the ministries because then no ministry dominates the discussion of the digital policy, but everybody can propose freely and so we ourselves use digital tools. So if you um, go to ey.pds.tw, this is a cybersecurity hardened platform that any app that runs on it is, um, we had a six months of penetration testing by the top notch white hat hackers that are second place in DEF CON worldwide and so on. So we know that this is safe. And every day I wake up, I look at my 22 colleagues from different ministries, and they all work out loud, meaning that they're not afraid of letting other ministries know what they are working on. And you can just track everybody's work very easily and form ad hoc teams. Now, for you who work in a startup world, this is nothing, right? This is just agile, Kanban, Scrum, whatever, right? But this is career public service we're talking about. This is the entire central administration, all at least 22 ministries learning to work in a very horizontal way. And this has been really working in the past couple of years so that when they see uh, a horizontal protest, a horizontal organization, they're not afraid of it because they themselves has been part of a horizontal organization. Um, is there any work on level three to level four autopilots? Yes, there's many uh, real needs from the municipality government that they tell us. Um, for example, the Kaohsiung city government really want to uh, take the last mile of the metro uh, into the places where the metro are not yet built, or maybe even in the Love River, they want to have some self-piloting boat that also counts as level four, even though it's not a car, it's a boat. Um, and in many uh, places, we're also hearing needs for automated drone delivery. Uh, and all of this will be in enabled by the self-driving vehicle sandbox. Remember, this is not a Minister of Transportation. This is a Minister of Economy. So they will develop in a way that is emergent, meaning that it can be a hybrid vehicle. It can be, I don't know, Hyperloop or something. <laughs> Anything that people's imagination take you forward, you can apply for the sandbox. And it's expected to, to be passed really soon, like this December. 
how do I think about the AI environment and opportunities in Taiwan? I think Taiwan, in terms of research, has always been one of the best places to produce quality AI research. I mean, I was a AI researcher, well, still am, uh, starting 1996 or something, and a lot of my friends around the time already work on machine learning. Even deep learning was not uh, in, in the trending uh, situation back then. But what I observed is that over time, many of my friends just went to the Silicon Valley or to London or to some other places to continue their research. But in the past couple of years, we're seeing a reverse brain drain. We're seeing people actually coming back to Taiwan. And the reason why is that while the previous generation of machine learning mostly focusing on abstract activities like playing Go, right, or playing chess, um, these are abstract. But nowadays, we're seeing AI's embodiment in a sense that they are now finding a body in the robots or in just the air quality measurement devices, sensor fusion, everything that gives the AI a different ways to perceive the world and also act upon the world. And for this, pure software doesn't work anymore. You have to have a very good design ecosystem. You have to have a very good supply chain ICT ecosystem. You have to have good optics, good um, audio arrays, and things like that. You also have to have a very quick turnaround. Even what we call AI on chip must be very quickly prototyped. And only here in Taiwan can you find this diverse supply chain literally just within one hour of each other. And you can build a fully embodied AI without much help from any overseas procurement sources, which is why like Microsoft set up an AI lab, I think 100 up to 200 people. Um, there's a director of uh, AI speech research, Cortana Ethan Du, who went back to Taiwan from Microsoft, is now building more than 100 people working also on smart city and human computer interaction and medicine. And there's also literally from everybody, IBM, Nvidia, Google, uh, Uber, you name it, and there's all AI extreme programs and our research labs now in Taiwan. So I think this new trend of AI embodiment is really bringing a lot of talents back to Taiwan. And also, we're very eager to try new ideas. So whenever you have a new idea that breaks the law or regulation, you can just talk to me every Wednesday face to face in the Social Innovation Lab. And I will make everything that I can help to make sure that the uh, reconciliation of the old text-based law and the new data and algorithm-based law can work together in a way that is fair to both sides. So um, someone asked, is AI best if it resembles human or is AI best if it resembles machines? This is a great question. I think it's somewhere in between. So humans Actually, a lot of uh, human gestures that we think are human, like when we smile, we follow each other's smile. If I look somewhere, you follow my gaze to somewhere and things like that. These were not early hominid traits. That is to say we evolved these traits with dogs. The early wolves and the early hominids co-evolved these traits following each other's eyes, following each other's nonverbal expressions, uh, which is why anyone, even people who don't know dogs at all, when they first time hear a dog cry, they can get the emotion in the dog's communication because we have co-evolution um, circuits in our um, neural network, uh, and the same for the dogs also. So what I think is most important is that we think AI as augmented intelligence as something that is woven into the social fabric. And it's best if it's not human-like, like, like uh, we don't expect a dog to suddenly become a full-fledged human, but we expect it to adopt especially nonverbal human traits so we can understand their emotion better, right? So we can, for example, not only um, know, they can know more about us in our society, but also we can know more about individual AI agents and the uh, situation they're in. And there's a lot of capacity for this kind of empathy that's built into our brain that I think the future human-computer interaction can really fully use. So uh, I think this I already answered, so I will just talk about weakness. Uh, we have a lot of strengths, but our weakness is at the moment of imagination uh, and risk-taking. Because 
uh, people in the earlier generation specializing in hardware often think of startup as something that is very costly, very capital intensive. So when uh, teenagers now want to start new startups, sometimes their parents say, oh, maybe not go there, maybe after you become financially independent, right? But now, if you have a good idea in AI, actually you can crowdfund, you can crowdsource most of the supply chain, and most of the work. It doesn't actually cost much to fail. So it's entirely okay to fail like five times and then finally find your product society fit. And this is actually the direction we're taking and the newer generation are totally for it. So what we're now doing is doing upward management for of our um, upper generation to convince them that startup doesn't mean the same thing as what it meant in their generation. A startup here is now just testing an idea. And our um, new company act also fully reflects this understanding. And I'm, I must say sorry for the next 15 questions because I'm out of time. But these are excellent questions and I wish you a great event. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. And now, here, we are going to give you, wait a minute, we are going to give you very special souvenirs. It's just, as you can see that, yeah, because Evan is going to give you the tailor-made pen. I'm going to introduce it a little bit, yes. It's a very special pen because it will shown in the newspaper or uh, magazines um, worldwide, and it's a tailor-made from the designer of Taiwan, and it has a pretty name, the weight of the words. You know, all AI, we are thinking about AI, it's all about the computer, right? And we're talking the computer nowadays, but AI is good, but we have to remember the worm that we really write something with our own hands. So, Evan, let's welcome Evan to give the really special and really, wow, yeah, unique pen here. Let's see the camera here. Thank you for your sharing. Thank you. And thank you, Evan. Thank you very much.